Hi, everybody. My name is Kara Sloat. I'm a mechanical engineer at Hammerschlag and Joffe. Uh, we're consulting engineers here in the city of Toronto. And today I'm here to talk to you about what makes mechanical uh, input important in the early stages of a design project. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you for the next 45 minutes or so. So first of all, what happens in a traditional project? When a mechanical engineer is involved in a traditional project, um, typically we are brought in after a lot of decisions have been made. We're hired at what's called the schematic design phase. So strategic direction, what building that you're building, um, planning, where are you going to put it, what size the building is going to be, and concept design. Uh, the major structure of uh, how all of the parts of the building are going to go together have often already been carried out. So we are hired at a time when there's already floor plans. And what I'm showing on the screen here is some of the typical input that myself and my electrical colleagues will provide for projects that are following this kind of delivery model. We'll run through and uh, explain where we need extra space, how much floor to floor height might need to be added, but we won't be able to influence um, how the geometry of the building could make the whole system more efficient. So in contrast, the integrated design process encourages teams to bring everyone to the table a lot earlier. So in this kind of project delivery, uh, a mechanical engineer might be involved as early as during the strategic project definition phase. So we do have more consulting fees earlier in the project, but we have more opportunities to make a bigger difference for the project by providing early input that may really improve the overall efficiency. Some kinds of pieces of input that um, have occurred um, in other exemplar projects uh, include identifying space for thermal storage, identifying access for natural ventilation, um, identifying how the construction of the building could allow delivery of heating and cooling. Um, so what's called uh, thermally active building systems or radiant systems um, can be integrated into designs if we plan it early enough. Uh, space for energy recovery, thinking about how stack effect will interact and making sure that the plan for a building has um, divisions between sections that are small enough to uh, limit stack effect, but high enough to allow uh, the mechanical engineer to maybe harness um, natural airflow caused by uh, rising air. Um, locating spaces requiring tight temperature control away from exterior walls or openings, leaving space for solar uh, collection on the south side of the building, um, and combining solar collection with other parts of the active building systems, as well as space for gravity drainage, rainwater storage, and harvesting. One of my favorite buildings in Canada that's followed this process is the Manitoba Hydro Building. So this was a building where everyone came to the table very early on in the process, and they were able to model 12 different kinds of geometry for the site to figure out whether or not a tall skinny building or a short squat building would make sense. They were able to rotate the building, even though the block didn't face strictly north-south, so that the actual building they finally designed did face exactly north-south, and that allowed them to create um, thermal atriums that face south on the uh, south side of the building um, that act as solar collection and air preheat uh, surfaces. So air enters these spaces, which are semi-conditioned. Um, they keep them at about 10 degrees Celsius. And then um, it is drawn by natural buoyancy into the rest of the building and then out through a solar chimney located on the north side of the building that also doubles, doubles as an exit stairwell. These kinds of very integrated designs are nearly impossible if everyone isn't at the table early on. Another part of having these results work is having energy modelers at the table. So you'll have met energy modelers throughout the, the process uh, here at the Better Buildings Bootcamp. Um, and I'm showing on the screen some preliminary results that have been used uh, at early stage design to help teams identify where the really big wins could be. So in um, 
pre-schematic design models. We often won't know much more than, uh, you know, say in the top uh, site use energy intensity on the right hand side, that the domestic hot water is the biggest remaining load in the building as it was conceived. Um, it's bigger than space heating and cooling put together. Uh, by contrast, the building on the bottom right, heating's 30% and that's the biggest load. So the strategies that uh, building teams might use to optimize these buildings will be different because the opportunities for reductions are different. Um, underneath the text on the screen here, you'll also see peak analyses, which can really help identify whether or not the sizing of the mechanical systems uh, is optimized. So in the peak electricity and fossil fuel use for this building, um, you can see that um, the peak occurs exactly at 7 a.m. when all of the systems turn on. And if they were more slowly staged, then we could potentially reduce the size of mechanical systems 20% without necessarily um, causing a problem for the rest of the building. Uh, the same happens in the peak fossil fuel use. We see that it really peaks sort of towards the end of the day. And that appears to be a scheduling thing um, for that domestic hot water. It's also worth saying that the goalposts for high performance design um, have moved and are likely to keep moving. When I entered this industry, we were solely focused on energy efficiency. Um, and then as the 2010s rolled on, we started talking about both energy efficiency and operational carbon uh, and even um, occupant comfort with those three things vying for um, importance as we were coming up with mechanical designs. Now that we've entered the 2020s, embodied carbon and resilience have started um, coming to the fore as design objectives for building teams as a whole. So what does embodied carbon mean when we look at mechanical systems? Operational carbon. Um, is emitted when we consume uh, both fossil fuels for heating and domestic hot water um, and electricity. But embodied carbon is primarily um, associated with the construction materials for the building. So big things in the, um, the concrete and steel for the structure and in the insulation and um, sort of major components of the building envelope. A really interesting study published by KPMB showed that in some cases, if we choose the wrong building insulation materials, we can create so much embodied carbon that it would have been better to use fossil fuels to heat that building for 30 years as opposed to buying these high embodied carbon materials. So in particular, they identified foams that had been blown using um, refrigerants as a blowing agent as being particularly problematic. So this chart here at the bottom of the left-hand screen shows that for those very high embodied carbon materials, um, if you put more than R12 in a building over a 30 year period, you would be using more um, overall carbon or creating more, more overall carbon emissions than if you had just heated with natural gas. If you're more careful about the material selection, then you can add almost uh, infinite amounts of uh, insulation and still not cause those problems. A second problem is uh, that mechanical systems are moving more and more towards heat pumps and refrigerant containing systems. And these systems um, contain refrigerants which have very high uh, climate change values if they escape. So older generation refrigerants can account for over 50% of the total carbon emissions from a uh, heat pump building. Choosing low global warming potential refrigerants or low refrigerant charge systems will be critical over the next 10 to 20 years to be able to achieve our climate goals. Finally, it's important to say that the decision-making that we're making during the design may not be real when we compare it to what the building will do in construction. So, what we know as an industry is that the modeling that we do is only somewhat representative of what actually happens. And there have been some really good studies over the last 10 years that have tried to identify where those gaps sit. So in part, they have to do with 
accurately predicting how a building will be operated, um, who will be in it, how long it will run. If we can figure that stuff out accurately, then we can make a much better prediction of how the building will operate. In addition though, um, minor changes during the design can sometimes have really big impacts. So diagnosing why a building uses a lot more energy in operation than it was intended to can have to do with really digging into what the assumptions were and um, trying to remedy those systems and changes afterwards. But the corollary is that keeping your energy modeling team on the overall design team and asking questions as we make minor design changes can really help identify when something um, that seems like it might not have a big impact actually could be very important. Finally, addressing the critical climate change of heating is something that I want to um, emphasize to everyone on the call. Um, today, space and domestic water heating account for 85% of all energy use uh, and 77% of all greenhouse gas emissions from the built environment overall. And we have to date in Canada, mostly been generating this heat for both of these uses using fossil fuels, either combustion or electric resistance. So Electric resistance is uh, in Ontario becoming much lower impact because we've closed all of our coal power plants, but it is very high cost and it also has a really high impact on the grid because um, at peak, it consumes a lot of total electricity. So it doesn't leave a lot left for um, running our new electric vehicles or for um, all of the other things we use electricity for. As a result, we really need to come up with more efficient options. And fortunately, those are coming on the market. The number one um, option that I want to highlight is cold climate heat pumps. So that's both air source heat pumps and geothermal systems. Um, together, these systems are available um, as distributed systems. So one installed in each room or small group of rooms um, or as central systems. They can be deployed um, throughout Canada with backup systems, and they significantly reduce the impact of a building on the electrical grid and substantially reduce the uh, amount of energy that's used uh, overall. So when we're trying to make that switch, the other thing we can do as designers is um, make the buildings that we design need less energy in the first place so that no matter which technology we're using for heating and cooling, the building uh, requires less overall. So this little um, triangle diagram on the right hand side of the screen sort of shows the paradigm of design that we've been at Sustainable Buildings Canada trying to promote, which is that if we can work first with our building envelope designers and architects to make a building more energy efficient, require less overall heating in the first place, and then we can find a way to reuse any energy before it leaves the building, then when we maximize the efficiency of our mechanical systems, we'll really already be working with a very small amount of heating. And that might make it possible for us as a country to then generate all of that energy with something that's low carbon. You may also have heard of district energy. Um, it's a very popular uh, solution in downtown Toronto. And I believe that the existing building on the site that we're looking at later on this week uh, is currently fueled by district energy. So key benefits of district systems uh, include that they allow access to um, a dedicated team that's running the mechanical systems for your building 24-7. Um, so you get really skilled operators at that like district plant level whose whole job is to make that system operate efficiently. But benefits that we hope that we will leverage include access to low carbon, carbon heating and cooling sources, which can't be leveraged at a building scale. So things like sewage heat recovery uh, down at Ashbridge's Bay or uh, recovered heat from uh, processes at industrial plants or off of a um, data center. But what is important to realize is that at the moment, over 97% of Toronto's district energy systems are fossil fueled. And 
even in the last 10 years, 95% of the new added systems that we have put in the core are fossil fueled. Natural gas boilers are small, they take up very little space, and they're hard to replace with a climate-friendly solution at a later date. Um, hard at a single building level, but even more difficult for a district heating system. So it's important if people are talking to you about district energy to know that only low carbon district energy is a climate solution. And only low carbon district energy should be used for new buildings if we're going to achieve our climate goals. Okay, I've talked a lot about heat pumps. So what is a heat pump? Heat pumps are a class of equipment that achieve a specific function. So they essentially move heat against um, the typical flow that entropy would require. So from hot to cold, a heat pump will move backwards from cold to hot. Um, it's the specific term that's used for small unitary equipment. So if you were buying a mini split for your house, um, this guy here in the middle of this slide, um, you would be buying a heat pump but it also is the word for the class of equipment. So a chiller is a heat pump that only moves energy in one direction. Uh, in the summertime, it will make the building cooler, even though it's hot outside. Um, you can add a reversing valve to almost any of these heat pump devices to make them go the other direction. So there are now products available that will remove heat from the atmosphere and put it into the building. So even your refrigerator counts as a heat pump. And in my opinion, heat pumps are going to be the best solution to the heating challenge of the 21st century. So just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the savings that are available, um, if you were heating a building with natural gas, you're generating about 220 grams of CO2, um, maybe more if you count fugitive emissions. Whereas if you use electric resistance in Ontario right now, you would only be emitting 35 grams. If you move to an air source heat pump, you only emit 11 grams, so more than 20 times less. Uh, and finally, if you were to then run that heat pump overnight, you would be essentially emitting negligible amounts of CO2, two grams. So you'd be comparable with the amount of emissions uh, from fully renewable sources like photovoltaics just associated with the embodied carbon of building the panel in the first place. So. These systems are really important and being able to uh, use thermal storage to move loads off of peak will further improve the performance of our systems. Okay. This slide is probably way too complicated, but I'm gonna try and explain why I'm ho hoping to show it to you. So when I say at the beginning of this presentation that early consideration of the energy balances is important. What I really mean is when we need to identify energy for recovery, we need to look at the whole building and figure out where energy is moving in and out of it, um, considering everything that's happening. So if you draw a diagram where you show the temperature that you need certain systems to operate at, and then whether or not they are pulling or pushing energy in or out of the building, then you can start matching these loads up and finding places where you have a cold, um, domestic cold water in, for example, and you can also figure out, well, maybe I need some cooling, um, for example, for my condensate in this diagram. Um, in the summertime, then you do the same kind of thing. So you say, I've got this domestic cold water coming in. Is there any way I can use that um, cooling to create a benefit for my building? Maybe I can um, use it to partially chill my cold systems for heating. Um, you can match up your exhaust air with your intake air and move the energy from one space to another. But another thing that's really important to know is that the farther you have to move energy along this um, scale from very, very cold to very, very hot, the more uh, enthalpy is involved. So the more overall effort is required to produce those temperatures in the first place. So another place that early mechanical involvement can help 
is by figuring out how to move these um, space uses to a place where a more reasonable, sort of more room temperature-ish um, energy temperature will still do the job. So on this diagram, you'll see that um, the building that we initially looked at was using district steam, which kind of comes in at 200 degrees Celsius. We don't need those temperatures to be able to create room temperature air. So you could potentially improve this system by sliding um, the temperature of your incoming water down. Okay. Now we're gonna get into the weeds for a bit. So specifically, not in general, what are some high performance mechanical strategies that I really want to see more buildings using? Number one, thermal comfort. Um, it is much more efficient to deliver heat using radiant um, systems than it is to use forced air. So when you use a radiant system, um, you're directly taking heat um, using radiation. Um, and you don't have to push air with fans to be able to make people comfortable. So it means that you can have lower temperatures in the air and still achieve comfort. It also means that you can use much lower um, conditioning temperatures because the large radiant surfaces can, if you use large radiant surfaces, can actually be kept at much more moderate temperatures than the coils in a forced air system. So considering use of thermally active building systems uh, where they're appropriate, is a great method for improving the performance of a building. Considering the interaction between mechanical systems and glazing, glazing is another great way to reduce mechanical uh, building energy use. So when we have huge stretches of exposed glass, even if it's high performance glass, um, there's what's called uh, downdraft discomfort and radiant discomfort when people stand too close to that glass. So as a mechanical engineer, I have to put, and you can see this in this um, picture here, uh, baseboard radiators at the bottom of these pieces of glass where I have to blow air on them to be able to avoid having those downdrafts that make people uncomfortable. So a way to improve these systems is to put a smaller amount of glass with higher performance in the building such that um, the temperatures and downdrafts there are completely acceptable without any extra treatment. And that just eliminates a mechanical cost altogether um, and is highly recommended. Overall, even if you are staying away from radiant, looking at low temperature systems um, is a great idea. So, what these do is they create thermal comfort improvements, um, indoor air quality improvements, because there's less air particle entrainment uh, into the air that's being circulated through the space. They give you energy benefits, fuel flexibility, reduced radiant losses, and allow the same systems to be used for cooling and heating. Um, and the only downside is that they sometimes have higher first costs since the actual systems that are being used are physically larger. Um, they also may increase pumping energy. So um, again, having our energy modelers involved to evaluate these options can be really great. Airside energy recovery ventilators um, are a specific technology that um, are not only required by code in many applications, but should provide a payback in every building. Um, this was identified by the 2030 district as the only um, energy efficiency measure associated with heating that improved the economics of air source heat pump retrofits. So they're really good. What they do is they move energy from your intake uh, fresh supply air um, to the return air stream so that if you've got very cold incoming air, you heat it with your return air and then the summertime, the reverse happens. So you've got hot incoming air and you cool it with the return air coming from uh, kitchens, bathrooms, these kinds of spaces and buildings. And this allows you to improve the overall energy use of the building by reducing the overall heating loads. 
So um, these systems are available in a variety of efficiencies. The efficiency is directly related to the size, the larger the unit, the better the energy recovery, um, and the lower the fan energy. So if we can get into a design process early and allocate space for these systems, um, we can get a much better performance than if we're trying to cram them into an existing floor plan after the fact. Um, there are even some new technologies that are using uh, heat pumps to actively move this energy from the outside air to the fresh supply air. So in that case, you would end up with air coming in in the wintertime that's hotter than the return air was coming out. So these can be up to 110% efficient um, overall and uh, are a really interesting up and coming technology. It will only be possible uh, to install an ERV that provides you with the maximum benefit if we can get all of the return air for the building to a single place or to the place where enough fresh air is being brought in that you can do energy recovery. So especially in commercial buildings, this can be a problem when there's not enough space for duct work or not enough thought about where mechanical, mechanical rooms are required. So on the right-hand side of the uh, slide here, you'll see uh, a couple of uh, fan options that show when you've got a bunch of little exhaust fans in a building, you're not going to get the same amount of overall energy recovery as you would have if you had managed to get all of that return air back to a single location. So this can be a really important thing. And it's pretty easy to check whether or not it's happened on any mechanical system design. You can literally just look and see how many standalone exhaust fans are in the final design. There's usually a little schedule on the mechanical sheet. And if you have a lot of standalone fans that seem to be exhausting to the outside, um, then there's room for improvement in the design. Heat recovery chillers are a really great technology that allows you to generate both hot water and cold water at the same time. Um, so you can move energy from a heating to a cooling system. Um, you can find all the simultaneous heating and cooling loads um, and ideally minimize them so that you can buy the smallest heat recovery children necessary. But whenever you do have those loads, this will allow you to, without ever leaving the building, um, generate heating and cooling for um, appropriate use. We talked about um, emissions at the beginning of the slide deck associated with fugitive refrigerants. So, most heat recovery chillers are still using quite high um, emission refrigerants, but there are new low GWP refrigerant technologies coming through. One particular low emission um, refrigerant I want to highlight is carbon dioxide. So this, uh, when we use carbon dioxide industrially or as a refrigerant, we're actually taking it out of smokestacks. So it is one of the few carbon capture and storage uh, technologies that's currently commercialized and, and working in the modern world. Um, and that carbon dioxide, even if it escapes, has a climate change potential of one compared to 1800 or even um, 4300 for some of the other competing refrigerants. Carbon dioxide also has a very good ability to generate very hot water. So it can generate up to 90 degrees Celsius water, which means that it can replace almost any kind of um, boiler operation. We are still working on developing these technologies. There's currently very specific sizes um, available from very specific manufacturers, but it is a kind of evolving field and we're looking forward to seeing more products in this category. Energy recovery from all of these refrigeration machines can be done not just by using the um, heat pump or chiller to move energy from one place to another, but also doing what's called desuperheating. So in each heat pump, there is a compressor and the compressor gets really hot while it's operating. Usually the systems are designed to use the refrigerant to cool that um, compressor and then just reject the heat along with wherever else it's putting heating. But you can uh, use a separate loop to harvest that very hot water and then use it um, often for domestic hot water heating. 
So this is a simple upgrade that can provide significant benefits if we know early enough that we're going to try and do it. So at the very early planning process, the thing that could limit the eff efficacy of this strategy is if your heat pumps and your domestic hot water plants are in different locations. So having those things in the same place allows you to leverage this technology. Drain water heat recovery is a really cool technology. We have both passive and active options. So either a simple heat exchanger that takes um, drain water either at source, so like right at a shower or where it's leaving the building and remove some of the energy, again, often for domestic hot water preheat because it happens kind of year round. But if you've got other year round heating requirements in the building, you could use it for that. Um, a more interesting uh, up and coming technology is active drain water heat recovery. So this is where we use a heat pump to upgrade the energy that's coming out of those tanks. But because our source um, is very warm, most drain water leaves the building at somewhere between 20 and 22 Celsius. Um, we get really good efficiencies out of those systems. So they perform much better if you're trying to do domestic water heating in the winter with that 20 degree source as opposed to using the 20 minus 22 that's outside. Finally, simple air source heat pumps. Um, this is a technology that has started being available, um, you know, 30, 40 years back, but they usually um, didn't do a very good job of heating when it went below zero. So um, if you've ever lived in a building or known somebody who owned one of these old school uh, heat pumps, they had to have a backup system for whenever it really got cold and they weren't appropriate in our climate at all. So people had them in Florida. Um, over time, there have been many developments. So cold climate heat pumps are currently available for residential buildings um, in Toronto with no upgrades. But we're even now starting to see even bigger products that are more appropriate for commercial buildings, um, like the project we're gonna be looking at this week. So these are available up to two, 300 tons in size, um, and they can generate often hot water and chilled water at the same time. So they are available either in um, optimized configurations that generate hot water primarily. Um, and those ones can operate down to about minus 15, uh, maybe minus 18 C, or in uh, models that are very good at doing both chilled water and hot water and maybe have a heat recovery chiller built in, but they often only work down to about minus seven or minus 10. So these are, again, a really evolving technology. Uh, we're going to see more and more offerings in this category, and it's a place where we need much more uh, policy support to really get these um, products into the market because we don't have the tools to do a conversion in every building um, in Canada yet, and we really do need to. Finally, you may have heard of geothermal um, systems. So there's two kinds of geothermal, and we're only really talking about um, the geo exchange type. So sort of true geothermal um, is referring to drilling a very deep hole or drilling in a location where there are hot springs, where um, there is magma close to the surface and actually allowing the temperature of the Earth's core um, to provide free heating um, or power generation. When people say geothermal in the Toronto market, they are usually talking about geo exchange, which is drilling holes anywhere from eight feet below the surface and run horizontally to 600 or 1200 feet deep. Um, these access the ambient temperatures that are available at those depths. So something in the range of 10 degrees Celsius year round. And so when you use that as a source for heat pump, just like the sewage heat recovery that we covered earlier, the temperature difference between the temperature you're trying to generate and the temperature that you're getting um, on the source side is low. So the amount of electricity you need to use to move the energy is also low. So that's really the benefit of these systems. They provide that benefit both in the middle of winter, 10 degrees C, as opposed to minus 20 out, and in the summer, 10 degrees C, as opposed to plus 30 or plus 35. Um, so they can be really helpful. There is a huge existing market for these systems. The biggest challenge with them is that it's important to know that they need to be balanced 
What does that mean? Um, it means that because the ground doesn't move heat very well, um, it's actually possible to overcool it through the summer and then not be able, or overheat it through the summer and then not be able to reduce the temperature enough through the winter uh, to bring it back to that like balanced temperature of 10 C. So it's important for a designer of a geothermal system to accurately predict how much energy will be coming in and out every year and to run a 20 year simulation, um, proving that the ground will stay about the same temperature at the end of that time uh, as it did in the beginning. So expert um, input on geo exchange systems is critical to success. And having a building operator who can commit to how they're gonna use the building is also really important. If there was a lot more heating than was predicted or a lot more cooling than was predicted, then a backup system would be required to make sure the geothermal system didn't lose capacity over time or like drift out of true essentially. So I've talked about a lot of these kinds of systems, um, heat pumps, geothermal, the deployment of these systems in Canada is really limited by the climate uh, zone that we live in. So uh, I'm showing a map um, of kind of each of the ashtray temperature climate zones um, in Canada, also mapped to uh, gardening climate zones, if you're familiar with those. Um, essentially, zone one and two are Arctic. And in those spaces, we are able to use geothermal but not really able to use air source without complete and total backup systems. So either electric resistance or something in the fossil fuel range. Uh, zone four and five, which um, kind of covers zone three, four and five, which covers us. Um, we can use geothermal or air source heat pumps, but have to select these systems very carefully. So depending on whether or not you're designing for Toronto or Belleville or Ottawa, the availability of systems and how effectively they'll, they'll run, how much backup they need, and when the backup runs is all going to be different. We need to rely on our energy modelers and on the equipment suppliers to provide careful details about those things. So if you're involved in um, a portfolio project or in a uh, business that has a large number of locations, um, the solutions for decarbonizing buildings are really going to depend on where those buildings are physically located at the moment. And finally, I want to say that all of that kind of future prediction um, is using today's weather files. And we know that it's getting warmer and it's gonna get warmer in uh, differential amounts depending on which part of the country we're in. So the more north you are, the more change in summertime temperatures we expect. Um, we do have predicted weather files for many locations, including Toronto. So when using energy modeling to inform design, it can be really helpful to run not just today's weather file, but the 2040 weather files to understand whether the system and the building that you've designed is going to work as well um, at the end of the life of the mechanical systems as it did the day you built it. Finally, I want to cover a few ways that the mechanical systems and building envelopes interact. Um, I alluded to this before when I was talking about windows, but if you can make those very high performance windows and walls happen, you can potentially reduce your plant size and terminal sizes. So having this conversation explicitly at the beginning of the design process can really identify those trade-offs and make sure that the, say, windows and envelopes aren't identified for future um, value engineering because you'd have to add a new mechanical system to offset them. Designing for natural ventilation. Um, we found that uh, in a morrison Hirschfield study of classrooms early in the pandemic, single-sided open windows without a high and low element um, actually provided insufficient ventilation. So just opening a window on one side of a room was absolutely not providing enough uh, air changes to provide good enough air quality for students. So if a building is intended to have operable windows with the um, hope that ventilation will occur, we need to plan multi-sided openings for each room or have access to um, thermal chimneys or other ways of drawing air through those spaces. Um, and again, energy models or CFD models can help with this. And there are also design guides that have straightforward recommendations on areas um, 
to do with heights based on previous energy modeling. These kinds of strategies also align well with daylighting. We can optimize ventilation effectiveness. So the amount of fresh air that's required to provide optimal air quality actually depends on the temperature of the air that's put in the room and where it's located in the room. So a low supply of cool air will provide much better ventilation and therefore you have to provide less air and heat less air in the winter time than if you supply that air at high temperature from the top of the room. So looking at uh, ventilation effectiveness, we see that kind of the overhead ventilation strategies that we've used for many of our commercial buildings are not optimal from an energy effectiveness perspective. Um, there is an approach called displacement ventilation that can specifically uh, reduce energy use by up to 30% for um, fresh air heating. To demonstrate the feasibility of these enhanced ventilation strategies, we can again refer to um, ASHRAE design guides, but for very complicated spaces, maybe considering CFD modeling to ensure success. And then on the right side of the screen, I'm just showing some spaces that were existing that have converted over to using displacement ventilation as an energy efficiency strategy. So this isn't only a strategy we can use in new buildings, but also we can consider for major retrofits. Finally, when we're trying to deal with outdoor air preheat, um, all of the technologies that we've talked about before can be leveraged so that energy recovery is one step. There's passive solar heaters available. We can use that um, atrium approach or uh, dedicated devices that uh, form part of the building envelope. Uh, we can use passive or active geothermal and combining all of these things together will substantially reduce the overall energy impact. So in summary, Having early involvement of mechanical engineers in the design process substantially improves building. Um, buildings, the way it does that is by ensuring the building envelope, the daylighting strategies, the openings for natural ventilation and the mechanical systems have been planned and designed together and optimized to be able to work as systems. Um, electric and renewable power technologies can be substituted for combustion to heat buildings across Canada um, most of these technologies are heat pumps, and they are um, widely available for use in the Toronto market, though still challenging in colder climates. Finally, optimizing energy recovery and energy flows is critical for high performance results. So I'm looking forward to taking your questions, and thanks you for your attention.